The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. You know, I've been talking about it. The new smaller bag from Pound, the Rufus, is almost here. You can check out videos of the prototype version one and two on Pound Disc Golf's new YouTube channel. Just search Pound Disc Golf on YouTube or go to youtube.com slash pound disc golf and you can check out the videos as well as an introduction to their new fly pack, which is available now. I can't wait to get my hands on a Rufus. Already they've built so many cool new things into just the version two of the prototype. So go check out the video and find out more. Welcome to The Upshot, Ulti World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhood. Joining me is Josh Mansfield. Josh is at Bear Lake. I am in Milwaukee. I'm outside. It's a beautiful night here. I, ho- I hope the weather is just killing it for you, Josh. How's Bear Lake today? Oh, it's gorgeous. I mean, we're in high 70s, sunny. I've played a lot of pickleball this week, and I still cannot beat my wife at a game of gin rummy if my life depended <laughs> on it. So <laughs> You got some disc golf to play while you're there or no? No, not a ton. I did hit up. We went down to to Logan and went to the Infinite Shop, though. Oh, nice. So I picked up some new plastic. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's a good vacation move. That's that's right. <laughs> um. All right. Well, we're gonna dig into some mailbag today and uh, catch up on some topics. And we always love getting your emails. You can always hit us up upshot at ultyworld dot com. And uh, we are gonna go ahead and just get started right away. There's there's no reason to wait. We don't we don't have any tournaments this weekend. I mean. We have the Prodigy Disc Pro Tour Hainola event happening over in Finland. Uh, a lot of good Finnish players in attendance, including Evelina Salonen and Hena Blomrus in FPO, Lauri Lettinen, Nicholas Antila in F, uh, in MPO, excuse me. And so maybe we'll do an over-under on that a little bit later. But let's dive into some mail. Josh, I will let you take it away and draw our first letter. Yeah, so so the first one's actually pretty old. It's uh, from when we solicited feedback on the show. This comes from Trevor. He says, no football or baseball talk, please. Signed a Canadian hockey fan. Well, for the Canadian hockey fan, I am also a hockey fan. Uh, I am a Dallas Stars fan who lost in crushing overtime fashion in Game 7 against the Flames. I hope the Oilers stomp them in the ball- battle for Alberta. Uh, I think the Lightning are favorites to win the Cup again, and the only ones who are going to stop them are the Avs. So there's your quick 30 seconds <laughs> hockey in the mailbag. Uh, we appeal to all of I audiences. have some hockey talk, too. Are you ready for some hockey talk? <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. I watched the Blues-Avs game last night. It's We're recording this okay. Thursday. Um Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it was looking like it was all over for the Blues, and then oh, man. they they pulled it out. I mean, they <laughs> go empty hard. net, they get the goal late, and then it the ab score back, and you're like, okay, well that's mm-hmm. curtains. And then they did they got another goal, <laughs> incredible. Um, so I'm I'm here with a very big St. Louis Blues fan, so he was going crazy. Like he had to like <laughs> he had to, like go outside and walk around to like calm down before he went to bed last night. <laughs> Um, so playoff hockey is, is look the goat of playoff sports. Oh, it is. It is without a doubt. And I don't know where Trevor's from, uh, but the, the worst fans to be around are Leafs fans. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't even want to be in the same room with those people at playoff time. So if, if you are a Leafs fan, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't feel bad and I don't take it back. So, all right, well, we're going to talk some actual disc golf now, Josh, what you got? Yeah, so I uh, really liked a question from, uh, let's see, where was it? Uh, Oh, so this one comes from Hawk. Hawk says, is the fact that a, and this is referring to Juliana Corver finishing third at the OTB Open. So is the fact that a 50 or 51 year old, I'm not sure how old she is either, uh, finishing third in FPO, a testament to the enduring greatness of Corver or a damning indictment on the quality of the rest of the current American FPO field as a whole. It's inconceivable that a 50 plus year old is going to podium in MPO. Scott Scotty, Stokely think- won the freaking skins, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just saying. Um, that's- I, it's a good question. I, for me, the <laughs> answer is that Corver is one of the greatest to ever do it. Okay, And I mean, yes, this was like a little bit of an outperformance from what we saw from her last year, but only a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was regularly finishing in the top 10 a year ago, 
And, and I guess you could sit here and you could tell me that it's because, you know, the, the FPO field just they're not good enough. But that's not what I see when I watch the game. Like, I see the quality of FPO as being at kind of an all-time high right now. And I think Juliana Corver is just a legend. I mean, when she was in her prime, she literally would go like months at a time without losing a tournament. I mean, she was so dominant. It was crazy. I think what you're seeing now is a player who, you know, understands her capabilities and is able to go out there and and still perform at a high level. I, I, I think, you know, I don't expect JK to win an event, you know, not, not certainly not on the Elite Series, but I think that the combination of the technical nature of the OTB course, it wasn't just a pure distance fest, right? It was it was a relatively technical mm-hmm. track. Uh Combined with it being, you know, in California, close to home, I think that sets up well for JK. I, I don't think this is an indictment of the field. I, I agree. And and while it's not a perfect comparison, nobody would say, is Tom Brady's success in the NFL an indictment of the level of skill of the NFL? Because I just can't see any other 45-year-old playing to the same level. Right. That he just, he's one of the greatest to ever. I mean, he probably is the greatest to ever do it. Right. And, and I think I think Juliana is in that same category in terms of just an overwhelming level of skill. That means she is able to remain competitive despite an ever increasing level of competitive competitiveness. On I, the I, I have, I have some visitors. Why don't you come on over here and ask me your question while we were, we're live on the air. What's up? Um, we have a ball. Can you back here? You have a ball. You can run back here and get it. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Thank you. Ball in the backyard here in Milwaukee. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let me grab the next question here this one comes from kevin okay. hey fellas i've been playing disc golf on and off for 30 years but i'm new to following pro disc golf i find worlds confounding and nonsensical one random tournament in the middle of the season decides the world champion i'm assuming there's good reason for it but on the surface it seems completely arbitrary and nonsensical last year's world champion barely finished in the top 10 of the pdga rankings how did this happen so I am probably going to get emails that say you haven't been in the sport long enough to answer this question, and they might be right. Uh, I, I I am I've not been playing since the '90s, right? That's just I haven't. Um, but what I will say is I think that this is the clash of two eras of disc golf. One that was previously defined by the World Championship as being the standalone you know, crowning achievement and a world of disc golf today that is seeking to emulate other major individual tour sports using the multiple major system. So, you know, that that's kind of the clash that I see between the two worlds and why I think worlds feels like such a disjointed title relative to the fact and, and why it's, it is honestly kind of odd because as the title of world championship, it becomes automatically the most prestigious event than the one that every player says they want to win. It doesn't have the most history. I think USDGC in terms, at least the most storied and tradition history that is establishing itself into the very fabric of our sport. I feel like USDGC does a better job of establishing that it's oftentimes, at least sometimes not the best run event, uh, in terms of a major, um, in, in relative, it's not always given the pandemic era, the world championships. And in fact, has largely been a U.S. dominant, uh, feature despite European players who are very good, but have never been featured to the same extent at the world championship. And so I, I think that it is a, a tournament that is a reminiscent of an older era of disc golf that is just adapting to the new structure that is designed around the modernization of disc golf in line with other traditional individual sports. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think Kevin's overthinking it a little bit. I get the point. But look, if I say, what's the most important golf tournament to win in the world? What do you say, Josh? I say yes. Masters. I mean, I've made this point before. World Championships is the Masters of disc golf. There are other important tournaments to win. And I will admit that I think disc golf broadly hasn't done a good enough job of establishing its other majors as being important. There's throwaway majors some years. Australian Open, anybody? I mean, 
Like nobody went to that. That's not a major, right? That's a major with the M in title only, but has no mm-hmm. bear. Like no one's like, wow, he won the Australian Open. I don't even remember who won the tournament. So I, I get it, right? But the thing is, really, we, we're we in this point where now we're ready for Worlds, the World Championships, to be a tournament that goes to Europe that's held mm-hmm. outside of the United States because that's the obvious thing that needs to happen for that tournament to continue to kind of have that weight. And But I yeah. think you're right. Like traditionally, Worlds has just been the sort of pinnacle tournament. And remember, it used to be, for Kevin and those who haven't been following as long, it used to be a nine-round tournament. It was like this insane marathon event where, you know, there was very little doubt about who the best player in the world was at the end of it. Because if you give... Mm-hmm the top rated player, nine rounds to prove it, they're probably going to average out and win the tournament. Um, So I, 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 but, but I think there's always going to be a top dog. You know, maybe you could argue that, that tennis has avoided that, that like they mostly feel about on the same level, but I would still say that like Wimbledon and US Open probably are ahead of the French Open and the Australian Open. I think that's a fair argument. So, Anyway, I, I think we are just now establishing a four major calendar. Like this should have happened mm-hmm. 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. But we're finally like saying, okay, we're going to have a regular schedule. We're going to have spring, summer, and fall majors. We're not just going to have two majors in September and October, and that's it. Like we've done that multiple times in the past couple of years. That doesn't make any sense. So you're right. It's a vestige of the past. But it's also just going to be the fact that I think forever that Worlds is going to be the number one tournament. And and that's okay. There, there, there's always going to be a pecking I, order. Uh, yep. And I, I, I agree with you. I think I think it is okay that that, that exists. What you got? Um, all right. So I have a, an either or, Charlie. I'm going to give you two emails that kind of have competing philosophies from our Simon interview. And I'm going to let you kind of break down what you think here. The first comes from Brent. He says that the discussion recently around the best and types of courses in disc golf has a common theme, which often revolves around golf courses, that putting disc golf on golf courses is boring. I hope that the OTB Open can put that argument to rest. This course has done everything you could want from a course and more except elevation change. The gaps and lines were as precise as any wooded course without sacrificing distance, and clearly the amenities, landscaping, crowd options, etc. are just as better on this type are just better on this type of course. Golf courses also have beautifully manicured land, and we should take advantage of this when we can. Okay. Okay. Uh next, so this is the argument for golf courses, which I will add is traditionally temporary courses, right? Sure. Uh, LVC, I think, is a notable exception. Most times, though, when you have these golf courses, they are being rented for the weekend for that event, but they are not regularly played courses. Sure. Our alternative is from Scott, who wants to add his perspective to the conversation as a player. He says, I think the more they can play on permanent courses, the better. As a player, it's really cool to see the pros playing on courses that I've played and have seen some on tour that are now on my bucket list. Who doesn't watch ball golfers play at Pebble Beach or St. Andrews and think, wow, I want to play there someday. I know guys that build vacation around ball golf courses. If it's about growing the sport and making those courses destination, making those course destinations is a part of that. People will travel to play Maple Hill, De La, Smugs, Milo, W.R. Jackson, Eagles, etc. Let's not take those courses out of reach. 99% of the people who play and spend money uh, out of the reach of the, 99, the 99% of the people who play and spend money on the sport. So this is one of the many arguments for permanent courses as, and, and I think, you know, obviously the dream world is that we purchase property that's like a golf course and build our own wonderful, beautiful facilities. Sure. Uh, we're not there yet, right? So in a, in a competing world where you either get the temporary golf courses or you get the permanent, but maybe perhaps less ideal for facilities, where do you fall in terms of these two arguments in particular? Do I have to choose between them? Not necessarily. I think I think <laughs> I get to cheat. I mean, I, I I feel like there's room for both of these options. Like the courses named by Scott, Maple Hill, mm-hmm. Dela, Smugs, Milo, W.R. Jackson. Like these courses are going to be there in 50 years. And that's great. 
And the Stockton Swenson Park course for the OTB Open probably isn't going to be there 50 years from now. Like, do we really think the OTB Open is going to be at Swenson Park for the rest of its time? Like, if if they achieve the vision they have to get that tournament to the point where, you know, it's a, you know, a multi-million dollar event, they're probably going to find land and build our own course. I mean, I, I, I could be wrong, but like, I mean, if you get to that point, the, the, the golf course is probably going to say we want a permanent course here. Right. So <laughs> I, th- I think, yes, right. while we have this in-between phase where really we can't realistically just afford to go out and buy property and manicure it like a golf course, I think we got to be able to go out and say, okay, let's find a way to turn this golf course into a, into a beautiful disc golf arena. And I think, you know, Swenson is a great example of that. So the thing is, that doesn't have to be the only thing we do. We can still have all of these more permanent courses on tour as well. I think there's there's plenty of room for both. I, I think the other thing that OTB offers is that it, it was a tournament that very clearly was designed around and, and prioritized spectator experience. And that can be done in multiple ways. You can have your party island and have Kevin Jones DJing the concert uh, for the pre sh- the 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 pre uh, act or show pre show. I don't. I've never been to a concert actually. So wait a minute, anyway, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> hold up. Say those words again. That can't be true. I I I have never in my life been to a concert. Okay, so um, hang on a second. Again, <laughs> do you like music? I I love music. You love I just, music. Yes, okay. yes. I understand that probably Pocatello is not bringing in the the you know the the A one acts, but you've never <laughs> been to a concert, my guy. You got to get yourself to Red Rocks in Denver. There's so many options for. I'm sure there's some incredible music venues out there in Idaho and in Utah. Like this has to oh, get Salt remedied. Lake. Like the audience, so- <laughs> we're gonna get more mail about this topic than anything else. I can't believe Look, you've I'm just never trying... been to a concert. <laughs> yeah, it's called no, the opening never. act, is what I would generally say. Opening act. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the pre-show. So anyway, uh... <laughs> okay. So uh, hold on a second before we continue. <laughs> tell us a little bit more yes. about what music you like, because then some people are going to like look up schedules and they're going to give you some ideas on what you could do, and we're going to have to send you so... somewhere. Upshot. <laughs> well, I'll fly out and we'll go to a concert. <laughs> I, it's funny. So one of my favorite bands is AJR. Okay. Kind of like that alternative, right? And there was somebody I knew who was selling two tickets to go to Boise to see AJR in concert. And uh, I chose to register for a disc golf tournament instead. And that's why you're so, a host on the <laughs> Upshot, my friend. <laughs> that's right. And why I'm not on some radio show instead. <laughs> um, yeah. So AJR is a big one. Uh I really I listen to a ton of stuff. And I think that's probably part of my issue is like I listen to such a variety. Like most of my playlists have only one or two songs by any given artist. And so it makes it hard for me to be like, oh, I want to go see this person in concert because I only listen like AJR would probably be the only band I'd be super interested in going and seeing okay. a concert. All right. Well, so I, I upshot at old folks. We're going to we're going to make this happen. <laughs> uh, so, OK, Josh, continue. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so so the point I was making is that um, OTB Open was a tournament designed around a certain spectator experience, and it's a spectator experience that I think is incredibly valuable and is absolutely necessary for disc golf. That being said, Maple Hill also offers a spectacular spectator experience, but in a different facet. It's one that has it still has the galleries it has options to follow cards but it feels more like the traditional disc golf experience and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing that may have to change eventually that may have to evolve if we ever reached but i think we're talking about so far in the future that it's not even necessary to contemplate i i think it is important that you accommodate spectators it is important that you're able to advertise and sell tickets to your tournament because the revenue source is very quickly becoming an important part of professional tournaments. But I also think it's true that Maple Hill and uh, Smuggler's Notch and uh, OTB Open and Portland Open can all offer incredible spectator experiences 
because they are two different visions of what disc golf can be. And as you said, neither one are necessarily correct or have to be followed at this developmental stage in our sports history. Let's continue to talk about OTB Open because Jeff emailed in and he was there. He said, I went to the tournament last year and thought it was one of the best semi-professional events I had been to. Was it a PGA Tour stop? Definitely not. But it was close to being run as well as a Spartan race. This year was different. This year was special. On-site parking that was next to hole one. So easy access to your vehicle and they can handle larger crowds so there's room for growth. It was free if you were a VIP. Lots of volunteers and a lot of really good vendor booths. Supposedly the pros were hanging out in the hot tubs on Saturday. I brought food in, but the food they served looked fantastic. They have invested in this mobile merch shop that sits in the middle of the vendor area as an official welcome to the event. And it looks very official, kind of like a welcome, you are here at the place to be. Lots of sponsor flags and signage. The event optically gave off an extremely professional feel. If you told me that this was run by a professional event company, like those that run festivals or large-scale events, I would believe it. I now have an extremely high expectation for this tournament. And I know that when they raise prices, I know that I'll get my money's worth. I save the best for last. My favorite parts of this event were before I got in and at one of the vendor areas. When you walk from your car to the tournament central, you had metal barriers covered in promotion funneling you down a path toward the ticket area. I saw those all over the course, by the way, like a lot, a lot of that crowd control stuff it looked very professional. Mm -hmm. um, before you got there, you walk past the putting practice area, kind of like a zoo. <laughs> but more like Disneyland, a, a zoo. I don't know about that reference. Uh, the tournament made waiting in line fun. I haven't even started the ride, and I'm excited. I get to watch my favorite players warm up. I get to see all the players I see online right in front of me. Lastly, Leonard Muse's shop and a few other vendors sat right in front of the driving range that they had rented out. So as a shop, I also get as I shop, I also get to see all my favorite players warm up their drives. And since it's a golf driving range, you get to see distance markers. It is nuts to see how far they throw. So uh, there you go. That's from Jeff. And uh, Josh, just uh, your reaction to that. I, I've been thinking a lot about the OTB. First, first reaction. Uh, anyone who's a spectator at a, a professional event, email us after the event, please. Every yes, time. Yes, yes. Because that's, we want to know. The, yes, these Good or are the bad. details that we Good love to hear. Yes, Exactly. Good or bad, give us your feedback because pros, I mean, we've asked pros, what was it like is like for the spectator experience? And they're like, know. I don't know. I'm not a spectator. I don't care. So please email us these emails. These are some of our favorites. I think they're they are really, really informative for us. Here's my my reaction to, to these thoughts then. I think that the OTB Open is doing something really important in the sport of disc golf. As an emerging sport, I think we have a problem that isn't necessarily unique in as much as that we have a perception problem that we have to overcome. Think about after the James Conrad shot, when on ESPN, you have the commentators saying, well, how drunk is everyone there? First off, uh, they don't say that about, you know, hole 16 at the wastewater management open. They don't say that about any NFL game or MLB game or any NHL game where they definitely should be asking that question. And people are almost definitely uh, drunker at those things than at the, than at the world. Without a doubt. Uh, we don't have riots in the streets after our teams or players lose. Like the 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 perception that disc golf is a bunch of you know pot smoking and drinking hippies is a perception problem that I think that we have to overcome. And it's not one that's unique to disc golf. Uh, pickleball is played uh, by older people, and you know cornhole is played in your backyard. And I mean there are tons of emerging sports that have to overcome perception problems in order to do so. The problem is that it can simultaneously create a culture war inside of the sport. You have people who've been playing disc golf for decades who are seeing the grow the sport mantra and watching the efforts of the PDGA and the Pro Tour to professionalize disc golf and feel like they're losing out on their game, right? That is a casual, fun, you carry three discs in a grocery bag and go play it at your local park. I, I don't think that's going away, but I think that in order to continue to appeal to disc golfers and what we love about the sport as well as the general sports world in order to gain legitimacy we need more efforts like the otb open who is one that's going to offer 
vendors and have the professional clean sponsorships and have the ideal spectator experience while simultaneously putting the sticker egg from OTB on a pedestal in the middle of the spectator Did area. they do that? I didn't and even hear Kevin, about that. They did do that. Yeah, I saw it on the live coverage. And, and Kevin Jones, a professional player, getting to be, I already forgot, what is it called? Opening act? Yeah. Yeah, the, the opening pre-show. act for the con- the pre-show for the concert series, right? It, it is, OTB is simultaneously professionalizing the sport, but also bringing in the parts of the sport that made people fall in love with disc golf. And that combination is a fantastic, difficult, and praiseworthy effort by both Sean's because I think it's the necessary steps to helping our sport grow and getting the backing of the participants in this sport who have been the backbone of the sport for decades to want to grow with it. Question for you then. This yes. tournament in the past has had cannabis sponsorship. How do you feel about that? Obviously it's legal in California or if it's sure. not fully legal, it's close enough. You know, we're seeing a kind of tide, particularly in the Western United States towards more legalization. Do you feel like bringing that in even if the it's good money is that a problem in your mind because of the stigma that you're talking about that's a really interesting question uh because and i've thought a lot about this question actually um because if you look at traditional sports demographics cannabis sponsorships are actually really terrible sponsorships um because they are i mean depending on your sports demographic you'll typically find uh those folks to be more conservative and older uh who are participating in consuming uh national sports sure. disc golf isn't necessarily made up of the same demographic. I don't think there's enough evidence that shows us what that demographic is, but I would be willing to bet that it's likely younger folks uh, just in general. And I think that the overall attitude towards cannabis legalization is changing. And I'm imagining we're at the crossroads where eventually in the next five years, you're going to have a, uh, actually, I don't know if it's next five years. As soon as it's legal nationally, a, a major sport is going, uh, one of the big four American sports is going to accept a cannabis sponsor. Oh, 100%. I, I'm just I mean, certain of it, right? You, you know it's, it's coming because they just all took the sports betting money. Like they've all right, taken the sports right. betting money. You can't even turn on the sports yes. events anymore without seeing live odds from FanDuel, DraftKings, mm-hmm. or whatever. So, And, and so I, I would be willing to bet that even mainstream sports ask these questions when it was like, oh, how do you feel about Budweiser advertising sure. for the NFL, yes. right? You're already seen as a bunch of hooligans. I think that's the exact same question. And while it's not to the same scale for disc golf, and I understand the perception problem that comes with it, I think even if we take them now, uh, every sport is going to be taking them as soon yeah. as it's legalized nationally. And that that doesn't it doesn't uh, exacerbate any perception yeah. problem that we might I mean, have. Disc golf- I think if anything... Go, finish oh, go that. Well, my last thought was, if anything, as as cannabis sponsorships exist for other mainstream sports, you are going to see the perception of the pot smoking hippie um, decrease for disc golf because that stigma just is one that loses its power sure. in a world where marijuana is recreational across the country. Sure. Yeah. I, I, and, and it's happening fast. Um, right. A couple of... American Ultimate Disc League teams, Ultimate Frisbee, mm-hmm. have cannabis sponsors, uh, dispensary sponsors on their jerseys, including one that's like front and center, huge across the chest. That's the Colorado team. Big shock. Um, <laughs> but they are basically the first sports team that, you know, and obviously it's like a semi-pro league. Uh, to to put a big sponsorship like that across the front of a jersey, and you haven't seen any of the big of the big leagues touch cannabis yet. But I think it is just a matter of time. I mean, it's getting legalized in New York right now. Uh, it should be legal like later this year or early next. Um, and you know, I think we're going to see that trend continue. And and here's the thing: it is just a simple fact, and I'm sure there's members of our audience. You know, you think about the demographics of disc golf, right? The sweet spot of, of disc golf is 25 to 45-year-old males. I mean, I would say that probably mm-hmm. captures about 80% of participants right now. Um, 
a lot of people smoke pot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like there's a reason it's a stigma, right? It's because it's a, it's mm-hmm. an act. There's like a there's a there's a seed of truth there. Um, and yeah. and you know, I, I think that as disc golf seeks to try to like commercialize fighting back against that is going to be necessary but you also then have this tension of like well but we also like want to put marijuana advertisements out to this market that is very very like prone to being positive feeling positively towards that so just something interesting to think about uh, I do think that having having it possible for people to go and feel like they're at a professionally run event that you can take your mm-hmm. mother to, that you can take your kids to, that doesn't just feel like you're walking around in the woods is an important step forward for disc golf. And we're really not that far away from it being the Wild West out there, folks. Like, I tell this story sometimes, <laughs> you know, at what Worlds was it? Um, Peoria Worlds 2019, I guess. World Championships. I walked into the park. There was nobody there. There was nobody checking my ticket. I could have been just like literally walking my dog in the middle of the world championships. Okay. <laughs> Things are changing super fast for sure, but it, mm-hmm. it was not a thing even five years ago to really think about spectators as a major part of what you were doing at your tournaments, unless you were USDGC or maybe European open, but things are changing quick. So anyway, uh, Josh, what you got? I've got a couple more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Next one, I'm just going to give you an opportunity, see if you wanted to add anything to it. Simon talked a lot about the, you know, creating kinds of mechanisms in order to have a rough and then out of bounds uh, rather than just the uh, you're in the fairway or your OB. Sure. Uh, I mentioned in that uh, interview, I talked about Devin, who recommended things like, you know, whether that be rocks or longer grass or sand. And, you know, Simon really liked the sand idea. I've heard some feedback. I think it was on Discord that you talked about the fact that, you know, tall grass means backups and rocks means either dangerous yeah. footing or damaged discs. But sand is one that a lot of people seem to really like the, the idea of. And Simon also kind of agreed that sand would make a pretty effective means of deterring run-ups. Uh, I wanted to see if you had anything else you wanted to add to, to Devin's comments on, on that course design element. So I'm kind of anti-rocks because of injury mm-hmm. potential. Um, I like the idea of slopes and hills. I like the, I do like the idea of sand. The only course that I can think of that has sand as a way cuz most of the time when you see sand on the course, you're playing on a on a golf course and it's a hazard. Yep. And like maybe you're putting from the sand trap and like maybe it's a slightly different different more difficult putt. What if that's a fairway trap, you know? If you're 250 feet from the basket, yes. maybe a little further than that for the pros. Let's let's say let's say you're 350 to 400 feet from the basket and you're in the sand. All of a sudden, you know, you're not going to be able to get as good of a plant. And mm-hmm. that could be an issue. I like that concept. Um, Simon's idea of like having, you know, m- mandatory forehand in certain zones. I don't know. That feels like feels like hitting a four point shot from the spot on the court in the NBA. It's just like it's a little too tacky for me. Um, there's definitely been some yeah. great conversation about this in the uh, Ulti World Disc Golf Discord, which you can join if you're a subscriber for less than four dollars a month at ultiworld.com, discgolf.ultiworld.com slash subscribe. Um, I'm tr- I, I've, I've been thinking about this question because I, I think it's a good one. I think there's a, there's a very fair point to be made that like if I'm in this zone on the fairway, it's a great shot. And if I'm two inches over here, it's an out-of-bound stroke. Like it feels very arbitrary. You know, that's why I always advocate for having sort of natural OB, like obvious lines and not even cart paths, like, you know, high grass or brush or mm-hmm. uh, a, a, a row of trees that you're not supposed to go beyond. Um, I think using using out of bounds to have, you know, boundaries uh, in obvious locations makes sense. But if there's a way that we can find, I mean, I think the, the obvious answer is like creating corners where if you get, if you don't land in the landing zone, you're going to have a difficult time. Um, I think it's having trees off the fairway that are going to obstruct you without it being total jail. I think W.R. Jackson is a great example of how you can do that effectively. I think more courses should be thinking about that, right? Because you have a lot of courses that you play where it's like, if you're here, you're great. And if you're 
three feet that way, it's just so awful you have to pitch out. And like you have to, I think Simon's right that there should be more of a middle ground between great and disaster. Like you want to have more of a spectrum along that as opposed to a very binary cutoff, which OB is obviously very binary, as is just like thicket. So that's my thoughts on it. I think the other thing I would add is I want more courses that have uh, decisions built into holes. I think of the par five on Fox Run Meadows, the crazy long one. I don't love the course design change because it's encouraged players to lay up more. But in previous iterations, it was 50-50 whether pros were going for it or were laying up. And there were clear advantages to the players that went for it uh, versus those that laid up. I love that kind of you know selection in terms of what where you want to take your risk on a hole. And, and I think more courses need to emulate that because even though there's OB that is quite punishing on that hole, you, you have very easy ways to avoid it if you play a certain style. Right. Uh, we talked a little bit about ratings recently and Hugh emailed in and he said, ratings are actually pretty good. The object in fantasy disc golf is to beat the ratings and it's hard to do. My best finds have come from finding a player joining the tour out of a hotbed area like Dallas, Charlotte, or Central Florida. I did well for a year and a half on Emerson Keith until his ratings and fatherhood caught up with his play. Thoughts on that, Josh? It's kind of a fantasy question. Uh, you know, a little bit, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's a... I love this point because it there are circumstances that make ratings unpredictable and poor metrics... Uh, you know, the length, the longer a tournament is, the more accurate we think ratings are. Um, the the longer a player's been on tour, the more accurate we find the ratings to be as a predictor. And, and so I think that to, I love this idea in fantasy then of, of that ratings, one, I, I, I always love when people reaffirm ratings uh, because, you know, as, the Simon, as Simon talked about, we all do care about ratings, even if we pretend not to. Uh, and, and number two is I really appreciate this perspective in fantasy that the goal is, in a sense, to find those players who may not be uh, is, as established and, are, and factor in those points of here's the course that these players are good at, the style of golf these players are good at. Uh, how long they've been on tour or at least have established ratings, et cetera, and use that as the mechanisms in terms of fantasy of how you're trying to beat the ratings. I, I think it's really a really interesting concept to think about it in the sense of beating the ratings. Josh, we got one more. This this is my favorite email out of the entire mailbag. <laughs> so, so some of you may remember, I hope you do remember, uh, we had an email... Uh, it was probably a couple months ago uh, from Tina, who gave us this wonderfully insightful email that was really analytic, analytical, and and had really good points to bring up. And at the very end, almost as like a a PS kind of at the bottom, Dakota. it just says, "Right." Uh, also, Kristen Tatar playing her best is better than Paige or Katrina or anyone else playing their best. We then laugh about this, talk about how you know the hot take at the last minute is just a little bit of spice uh, on top. And then she emails us after that show and says, I have to stand by Kristen Tatar at her best because I'm her country woman as a half Estonian. Well, the half Estonian in Tina is walking back that claim. We got an email during OTB. The subject line says, I may have been wrong about Paige with a screenshot of her scorecard from round two <laughs> and nothing else in that email. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no other analysis, no other points, just <laughs> round two scorecard. And I may have been wrong about Paige. Incredible. So I thought it was <laughs> I, I still, every time I look at that email and see it in my upshot email, I, I, I have to chuckle. So... <laughs> Appreciate the email, Tina. Appreciate it. Uh, I, I think I think you were wrong about Paige as well. Uh, though Kristen, Kristen is, pl is playing amazing golf. Yes, she is. Kristen is very, very, very good. I still think peak Paige is best player on earth. Uh, and I think you see glimpses of it. I think you saw it in round two at OTB where she was just lights <laughs> out. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that's that's great stuff. That's great stuff. You gotta you gotta own it. You know, sometimes <laughs> you gotta take. It's not right, and you just gotta own it. That's so right. So thanks for emailing <laughs> Tina. 
That is going to do it for our mailbag segment here. Thank you for uh, joining us on this Thursday episode of The Upshot. And I hope you, if you haven't already had a chance, please go listen to the Simon interview from our Tuesday show. Uh, it's fantastic. And Simon is just a, a joy to talk to, um, incredibly honest and insightful. So I encourage you to go and listen to it. I know it's a long show, but but uh, it's worth it. So, Josh, over under for Heinola, we got to get it in. It's Thursday. What you got for me? So it, the the FPO side, you have uh, Henna and Evelina, and, and they're the only only two FPO that are. Uh, you've got a couple other names that are recognizable, but in terms of uh, kind of the powerhouses, those are the the two that you'd expect. So over under. We're going to do, because uh, you do have some good players in there, over, under, you know what, let's just keep it between those two. Over, under, two strokes, two and a half, we'll say two and a half strokes, separating Evelina and Henna. They don't, that doesn't matter if they win, right? Just those two, two and a separated half. by two or more strokes, uh, two and a half. I'm going to go over. I'm going to go okay. over. And I'll even give the prediction that I'm going to give the prediction that Hannah wins by like four to five strokes. That's my take. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So there it is. That's going to do it for our Thursday show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, our subscribers got access to our OTB Open React show last week uh, over on Sunday. And uh, we'll be back next week with another subscriber bonus segment every single week. We've got one for you. And you get to join the Discord as well and lots of other benefits. So we hope you check it out. For Josh Mansfield, I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long. And we'll talk to you next week right here on The Upshot. Upshot.